Okay, I did my presentation on foot rot and cattle. So my background of you know why I've been around this is I grew up on a commercial cattle farm and raised a small show stock herd, uh, did 4-H, that kind of stuff, and also worked on the farm. Worked at a cattle breeding facility in high school for two years. Uh, got a lot of good information working with veterinarians there. And then worked at the Purdue Beef Unit here for two years, um, my freshman, sophomore year working with vet students every day, dealing with this issue. And then last year, um, I got AI certified through cattle breeding at uh, ABS um, Global Genetics. So the reason I put this up here is every situation I've worked in, I've seen cattle foot rot, and it's just a really big problem that's always been around, so it's a good thing to get awareness about. So what is foot rot? Foot rot is a bacterial disease known as FUSO, bacterium necroforum that releases toxins that will cause necrosis in affected tissues. It begins when the inner digital skin is irritated or damaged in any way. Foot rot is explained to be a very fast acting bacteria that gets through the inner digital skin and affects the tissues in the foot, spreads to the tendons, joints, and bones in that region. So here's an anatomy of a cattle hoof. Um, where this is going to be happening at is the interdigital claw, and that's right here in this area, all the way down to where the axial wall meets. So if between the medial claw and the lateral claw, that's where you're going to have all your infection. And so this is a healthy hoof, and this is um, a healthy cow that does not have foot rot. You can see that its posture. Is at a good angle, it's you know aware, it's looking at us, it knows what's going on. It doesn't uh, present to be leaning or limping or anything like that or favoring one foot. And you can actually kind of tell on this hoof to the left, there might have been at one point foot rot and there's some scar tissue, but at this moment, that's not scar tissue, that's just, or um, foot rot, that's just scar tissue. Okay, so this is what foot rot looks like. Um, this is a veterinarian on the left spreading the uh, lateral claw um, apart and you can see right inside there how there's infection there is um, actually some scarring start to start um, happening there and then on the right here is comparing that to the picture that we just showed of the healthy cow you can tell how this cow is kind of leaning and favoring this front left foot trying to get weight off of it which is just really bad especially if you're in a packed um, stockyard with a, a lot of feeder calves, that can be a really, really, really big issue. Okay, so how this happens or how the causes happen is three major things. The first one is climate, which will come down to damp, wet, cold, and muddy conditions. This is, I mean, this is just Indiana, Midwest to a T. When you get around winter and into early spring, you know, the snow starts to melt, mud will build up. This is just how it happens around here and it is really common around here. It doesn't actually happen as much out west. If you go to like a Texas feed yard, it's dry, warmer conditions, you're not gonna have it as much, but it still does happen. Um, so then living environment of the animals, rocks, gravel, rough cement can get up in there. Anything that can cause a puncture or swelling to that inner digital skin um, will cause it. And then other ones that people don't usually think about but have um, happened in the past, lacerations. So you can have a cut or foreign objects, which could be nails from the farm or corn stalks or anything that would just be ir irritable to skin, really. So here are some major symptoms. Uh, we got a lot here, but there's a couple main ones. And the main one would be swelling of the inner digital skin. That's what you guys saw when I pulled up the picture of the veterinarian showing the hoof. Um, and then bleeding of the inner digital claw. So I changed that to claw because when you're out checking cattle, obviously you can't see the bottom of their hoof, so you're going to see bleeding on the claw and not from the actual inner digital skin. So that's the difference there. Um, and then foul odor, that's, uh, that's a, a telltale sign of that. Lameness, so that's um, the picture we looked at. It showed the cow was limping, didn't really have all the weight on all four hooves. Loss of appetite, fever, milk production decreases, and lethargy. Okay, so treatment options. If you catch it in early stages, um, these are people who check their cattle every day. They're able to uh, you know, catch it right when it happens. You can actually just clean it out and put on a foot cure gel 
and trim the hooves. This will help clear it up um, really easy, really cheap, and we'll get more into price and that kind of stuff towards the end of it. But that's, that's best case scenario. Common treatment, this is when you catch it two to three days in. Um, the infection's already taken place, but it's still treatable with uh, Draxin for mature cattle or LA-200 is for non-mature cattle. That would be your stalker calves, um, cattle that just got weaned off their mothers, that kind of stuff, and trim hooves. And then late treatment, this is um, more common in cow-calf operations where you don't see these animals as often, larger pastures, and um, you know maybe they've been infected for a week or so and you just weren't out there checking them because it's such a large area. This is uh, gonna call for surgical amputation of the claw and trim hooves. And the reason I put trim hooves on all this is one major way this happens is when you have cattle that have unequal hooves and pressure is unequal, it can really jam rocks and gravel in there and that's a big way it happens. So they always trim hooves and it's just if you have the animal in the chute, you might as well do it while you're there. Moving on to prevention. So how to prevent these issues from happening. Um, manure management is huge. Um, obviously, if you have a cut or anything and then you're stepping in manure, that's just bacterial everywhere. Um, concrete slabs are huge and a lot of people will place these next to feed bunks or watering pens where animals will be um, often or every day. Drainage systems to get that muddy water out of there, to get the bacteria out of there as much as you can. It'll never be perfect. And uh, nutrition, <clears throat> this comes down to your feeding regimen. Uh, it's good to have vitamins A and D and zinc in your feed rations. Regular health checks, if you can't check animals every day, try to check them every other day. See if there's any limping or any of the symptoms we were talking about. Bedding and shelter are huge in the winter, especially in the spring when you have those condition changes and keeping a dry area for the animals to stay. So when it comes down to cost, I have what it's gonna cost your operation in the long run, but also, you know, money-wise, what it's gonna cost you up front. So the big ones I put here are weight loss. If you're running an operation with cattle and your job is to get them up to market weight and they're not able to go up and eat at the, at the feed trough because they're hurting or they don't have the dominance to get up there and make room for themselves, then you're gonna have weight loss and that's gonna impact your operation directly. Um, delay on the market, so when you treat these animals, especially, you know, stalker animals that are going to go to, um, to the consumer for consumption, uh, and you, you know, dose them with Draxin or LA-200, you have to wait for that drug to get out of the body system, which could be, you know, a month to two months or however long it calls or however long it takes for that uh, medicine to get out of the system. So that could delay when you sell your animals and get you off track. Uh, milk decrease, that's huge for cow-calf operations. And then lowered fertility, this is a really big one, especially here because foot rot is common in late spring and that's also the breeding time. So your bulls will lose uh, libido and the females won't want to be um, bred either way because of the, the feet injury. And then uh, the, three, the three methods of curing that we talked about were the foot cure gel. This is uh, your cheapest option. This is if you catch it early. That's 20 bucks for a bottle and they only gave it in um, weight size, so that'd be a pound bottle. And then Draxin. Draxin is very expensive. It's a common drug to have if you have beef cattle or even dairy cattle. But um, uh, that's 270 for a 50 milliliter bottle. And then LA-200 is $25 per 100 milliliter, milliliter bottle. But the thing with LA-200 is it's usually only given to stalker calves or younger animals. Draxin's uh, usually for larger animals. Okay, so recovering and dosing. If you catch it early, you can typically get rid of it in two to three days. This is the early stages. This is with that gel I was talking about. Um, this is the ideal situation, obviously. That doesn't always happen. Common treatment, just from past experience, this is the most common thing that happens. It's typically if you can get them dosed with Draxin or LA-200, it'll be gone in three to five days. You know, get, I've seen it gone in two days, I've seen it gone in a week. But three to five days, I would say, is uh, average. And then late treatment, this is, there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of infection, a lot of issues, and you do that amputation, that's gonna take one to two weeks before the animal's even feeling healthy enough to get up and moving. This, in a commercial operation, the late treatment usually won't happen. That animal will be put down um, 
because it's going to be such an issue that you're going to have to deal with. It's going to be more of a pain in the neck than it is going to be good. So, and then dosing. So how you're going to actually um, give the medicine. The foot cure gel, you can apply plenty. It's a gel. It's not a big deal if you give a lot. Um, it's better to give a lot than too little because when you give them the shoot, you just want to get it done once and not have to do it again. Uh, LA200. So this, this calls for a booster shot. So the initial shot will uh, be right when you notice the issue happening, and then you're gonna wanna wait 24 to 48 hours with follow-up shot. Um, anywhere between that time range is fine. The most effective administration is intermuscular. Uh, that is, to me, the easiest method, but it's more commonly used in subcutaneous because these are stalker caps going in, and a lot of people just wanna do it that way. I've seen it done, I am, a lot more times, but either way works. And then Draxin is one dose, that's why it's usually more expensive, and it's most effective through intermuscular. Um, I am method, again, is really common. And then these are my sources, and yeah. And that's your story and you're sticking to it. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, questions, comments, similar experiences? <clears throat> yeah? Uh, after treatment, do you kind of want to like keep the cattle on a dry lot or in like a bedded area to keep them from just continuously like going through the bacteria? Or is it just kind of like once you dose them with Draxin, you can just kind of let them go out with the herd and they'll be fine? Okay, so the question was after dosing them with Draxin or whatever medicine you use, it could be the LA200. Do you want to put them back out in the pasture with all the other animals, or do you want to put them on bedding and um, you know get them in some housing area? So I would say it depends on the situation and what time of year. If you have a rare case like, hey, we got foot rot and it's the middle of summer and we got a dry pasture, I would say you could give them the Draxin and let them back out in the pasture. You would be fine. Um, if it was springtime and you're trying to breed this female here in a couple of weeks, I would say. Keep them in shelter, keep them on bedding, because you want to make sure they're ready to go for breeding season. So. Yeah, I think it's a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For like the one to two weeks when you have to like pull from the herd, is that mainly just because it's going to be like a lifelong problem afterwards? Well, a lot of the situations, that, or the question was um, after the amputation, are you going to want to um, keep them separated from? either ones are from the herd and the answer to that is the amputations I've seen I've only seen two or three they take part of the claw and they try to salvage as much as they can because living with this is going to be a real problem if you don't have that other part of the hoof but um, I would say keep it separated for that time period because you're going to want to see how it recovers and you're going to have to feed it separately because that animal won't be able to get food compete at a feed yeah, there's a lot of competition if there's a group of cows. Yeah. There's always the boss cow yeah. and uh, the other ones, and everybody's got a hierarchy. It's amazing. How about the use of foot baths? Uh, any comments on that? Foot baths, um, at, the, at the experiences I've had, commercial cattle, you don't get them in as much. Um, so foot baths, have I've seen them happen in vet clinics, but at the commercial farms, not so much. I'm sure if you had this in a show cattle operation, you're working with those animals every day, it would be something that you'd be able to do. Um, but the commercial operations I have worked on, not so much. Some more questions or comments? I just have a comment on okay. that. Go ahead. Um, so this summer I was working in like the animal health industry and it was really cool because I was able to tour different barns and stuff. And so this was a dairy barn, not um, a feed yard. But it was really cool because they were using like robot milkers and everything. And so as they were waiting in line for the milkers, they would stand in the bath. Mm -hmm. And so that's how they treated and helped prevent right. it for the yeah, dairy Yeah, it's so much easier with dairy cattle because they get milked two, three, or four times a day. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they have to go through this specific area. But if you're in a pasture that's 200 acres and yeah. you're lucky to see the cows. That's, that's, I would say that's the biggest struggle between the dairy and the beef is those dairy cattle, like he said, they're coming in every day, multiple times a day. When you work with beef cattle, if you get them in the chute, you try to get as much done at one time as you can. You're gonna try to vaccinate them, you're gonna try to tag them, you're gonna try to fly spray them all at once, because it's a pain 
to yeah. get them in there multiple months. And they're wild too, yeah. oftentimes. I mean, the dairy cow is such that you can go up and scratch your neck. There's some beef cows that want to hurt you. Yeah. I think there's one other thing over here. I was going to ask about copper salt, but you already answered it with foot pads. Okay. Yeah. So you have some stuff to prevent it. Okay. We Great. Got, we got two oh, two more. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So is foot rot common in underhoofed animals, or is it primarily just cattle? Um, I know it's common in, like we said, beef and dairy. Uh, sheep is the other one, and I'm not sure about any others, just because I don't have that much experience in those other fields. What makes a big point? Are their hooves dry or not? You know, that's you made that good mm -hmm. point at the beginning. Most, you know, if the animals are in this very wet thing that they never dry out, they almost anybody can get foot rot because it's just bacteria there. The manure, it's you know, terrible when it's wet. Like you said, springtime when the snow is melting yeah. and it's raining. No matter how good your drainage is, it's usually it's, yeah, hard it's to keep things dry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the iron and the uh, Graxon you were talking about, uh, this is a general question. Uh, do you yourself administer that, or do you have to call in a veterinarian for that? I was wondering if that would be another associated cause of calcium. Yeah. Repeat it. Repeat it. Um, the question was for the Draxon shot, the vaccination, do you have to call in a veterinarian, or can you just do it yourself? Um, my suggestion would be, uh, I've been doing this for a while, so I feel comfortable giving an IM shot. They're super easy in my opinion, but if it's your first time, I would make sure someone is there that knows what they're doing just to show you. It is, it is an easier process, but um, make sure someone's there that's done it before. You don't need to call a veterinarian though to answer that. Thank you. One more? We're all good. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Caitlin.